Hello all. This is another video with Dustin the Husky. And let's talk about some um, could go either way with this video. May as well just go with the one that I would rather like to talk about. On something fun. And something for anyone to really consider if they've ever had an interest. And that is what's it like to own a classic car? Where do I begin? Um, let's start off with the definition of a classic car. The Hot Rod, Hot Rodders Association, I think, pretty much most organizations and most states in the United States classify a classic car to be older than 25 years old in the month and year of its production. Unless you're Wisconsin, where cars don't last past 25 years anyway, so they've reduced a classic car by definition to 20 years. Because we're fucking special. Yeah, because the amount of uh, salt that we use on our roads just chew up a car so fast. Um, cars at two years old are starting to rust here in the state. I don't know why. Oddly enough, they're all Chryslers. So, <sighs> Chryslers using water-based paints are not enough uh, corrosion resistance in their zinc plating or... Too much a nerd to know much about this. There's so many ways that why a car would rust. But anyway, 25 years old. Unless you're in the, in the America's Dairyland, 20. What's considered a classic car? Well, to a lot of people, something interesting, something exotic, something fast, something sporty. To me, that's almost too boring. Yes, yes, I said it. I'm going to look at a Corvette, Camaro, Mustang, whatever. Muscle car. I go to a car show all the time. You know what? I appreciate those cars. I really do like them. But you see them all the time. How many times are you going to see a Mustang at a car show? That's not even a classic car. They just show up with a modern Mustang and say, oh, I got a classic car too. Oh, oh, I got so many ponies under my bonnet. It is interesting to see modern cars at a classic car show. While a lot of these plastic, fantastic machines, they're great right now. They won't age very well in 20 years anyway. So... 1999 is going to be the best last year for any classic car. Anything past that is worthless. Unless it's an exotic sports car. Your 2010 Camaro ain't worth shit in the next 40 years. Because there's too much plastic in that car that once it degrades, you don't have any chance to repair it. There's not enough metal in the car to make it last long it's worth. So... Now, any car. Any car more than 25 years old is going to be considered a classic car. And the 1990s is the last good decade in which to make a good classic car out of. Because that's when cars were still being granted. Lots of plastic in these cars in the 1990s. However, when you really think about it, they are using a lot more metal back then than we are using today. So they're going to last a little bit longer, structurally in some ways. Um, plastics are the bane of classic car owners. Because they don't last long. you got to take care of them. you got to be gentle. Because, um, let me tell you this, 1960s plastic is uh, it's hell on earth. And you thought 80s plastics in some imports are bad. The plastics on some GM cars in the 1960s. Ugh. I'm afraid to touch them in my own car. So, I just told you what a classic car could be. Could be anything. 
Doesn't matter, it could be car, truck, SUV, whatever. It's considered a classic motor vehicle. And you don't have to go with the typical Mustang, Camaro, Firebird, Corvette. While those are great classic cars, they're the most overdone in the segment. I am more interested, and I've done this before, I am more interested in looking at a 80s uh, GM J-Body Buick Skyhawk, which is the equivalent to a Chevy Cavalier, looking at a T-Type Coupe parked alone in a parking lot among with other classic cars that no one else seems to pay attention to. I am that nerd that takes pictures of this thing all over the place because they're rare. I think they're unappreciated, which is unfortunate because I think the most unappreciated cars tend to be the most important because they're the ones that a lot of people use on a day-to-day -day basis. When you buy a Camaro, when you buy a Mustang, you more likely already have a second car that you drive in the winter or for anything else, and you really use your Mustang for special runs. Uh, you know, it's casual Friday at your job, and you want to bring your Mustang out to work for that one day, something like that. And then you drive it for the whole weekend. You drive it for a whole summer, but you still have another car to do your dirty work with. But what about the cars you do dirty work with, that you drive every day? Salt and grime, mud, hailstones, sleet, all sorts of occurrences. These are the unsung heroes that don't get saved. And you see hundreds and thousands of these pretty stereotypical classic cars that are being kept are the ones that overrepresent. More interested seeing really the most mundane, ordinary, boring cars because they turn out to be the most interesting out of a car show because it's always how and why and who saved this car when it could have easily been thrown out. You get better appreciation with some of those cars. And you know what? They're not that expensive. I mean, with like, you look at a car, you want to find one that's in relatively good shape, not something that's a total hand basket. Mechanically, electrically, structurally, you want to find a car that doesn't require that much work or no work at all. You're better off finding a classic car if you're in the market to find a classic car, regardless of what you're looking at. If you have a specific model in mind, only look for that specific model. If you're just looking for anything just to say, hey, I want something weird and something to call my own, scan everywhere and all the places, you will definitely find something. But knowing my experiences with a classic car, which... You know, family-owned from 1967, from brand new. It is rare to have a family-owned car staying in the same family. But you may not have that luxury. But you still want to have some form of automobile that you can take to a show and have someone appreciate. Yes, go find yourself in an early 80s Toyota Corolla wagon. Find it from some granny who's kept in her garage for the last 40 years. Take in well good shape, no rust, paint still well intact and shiny, and the interior is spotless. With a full service record. And you may only get it for a few thousand dollars. Those are the kind of classic car deals that you can't get with your stereotypical classic cars that command way too much, no command, command way too much money than what they're actually genuinely worth. Because you'll find so many Chevelle SS uh, 454s out there, but yet they're going for $80,000.
for their really, really, really crisp, nice ones. But there are more of them. There are more of those existing out there all over the world than there are of my Skylark. They made 40,000 Skylarks of my body style in 1967, which was the most common for Buick of that year. Since it was just an ordinary car, it was a sport version of their luxury car. But all of them got junked. And my calculations of that 40,000, with my specific model, with my specific engine, transmission, and rear axle type, for the most part, they made only 4,134 of them from brand new. Okay, so of that number, less than, I think, 200 are known to exist. 200 out of... 4134 that were made and 200 out of 40,000 that had been made initially. Just two door hard top coupes. The level of attrition that my car's body type model year is incredibly high. It's not a muscle car. It is, it is technically, it's not just based on a muscle car. It can be a muscle car. It's all uh, Skylark, GS, same body, same car, just different badging. But those cars didn't get saved because they were not uh, labeled in the GS muscle car moniker. So, of course, they got smashed to smithereens and junkyards. They got... Uh, destroyed in uh, what you call them? What are they called? It's been so long. Um, demo demolition derbies. So many of them have seen their fates in demolition derbies, been ridden until the wheels fell off, which for these cars are incredibly hard to do. So I don't own anything too special. But when I tell people what I have, they're more curious about what I have because not many of them survived. It makes a good talking point, and people get curious. So, you find something, you buy it. Most preferably, find something that does not require much mechanical work, something intact, because let me tell you this. It's good to have an intact complete car because that's less time you have to spend looking for spare parts that are necessary to finish the job the project your your car make it look 100% because otherwise like me and like my dad we've been working on this car since 1989 and while it is close to 90 to 95% complete there's still a few things I must do in order to get it fully complete to where I never have to touch it again. Just drive the thing. Enjoy a classic car for what it is. Preserve it, save it, but also enjoy it. It's meant to be enjoyed. So what's it like owning a classic car? It's all simple. It's all analog. And even if it's a car from the 90s, you don't have all this high-tech stuff. You don't have GPS. You may not even have a CD player in it. Dashboards are simple. Your doors are lighter because there's not much sound insulation, but also really... They're pretty light. Um, even my grandfather's 84 Camry... Those doors, you could literally open and close with just your pinky finger. And my husk pinkies are small. And I could slam that car with just pinkies. So, what's it like? Well, you realize these cars are a lot lighter, unless you buy a tank, and then at that point, you're getting bismal gas mileage. If you bought a truck an older SUV, or a boat of a car. 
gas mileage is going to suck. My Skylark could probably get eight. Actually, on average, it can get 18 miles to the gallon. At least on the highway. Helps with a bigger tank. If you're if you eggshell the throttle, you can get 20. So that's hypermiling in a Buick Skylark of the 1960s, and actually, that's not so bad. Some pickup trucks today still can't get that much. So, but if you buy a four-cylinder car from the 70s, 80s, or 90s, you're going to get infinitely better gas mileage, even better than cars built today, just because they're lighter, simpler. They don't have as much weight. They don't have as much mass to haul around because they didn't. They didn't have to. Especially 80s cars, which are notoriously lightweight. And people thought those cars were getting heavier. And in hindsight, they're, it's pretty light generation for cars back then. Even 70s was incredibly lightweight. Parts. Brake parts is maybe the one big consumable thing you're going to have to be looking into. You break to stop. So, or let's actually talk about general maintenance on a car, keeping spares and whatnot. What kind of stuff do you want to take, uh, keep for spares for a car? What to have in your car just by traveling around your county, the state, the country, if you're going to shows, you just want to drive your car somewhere, have a road trip in it, fine. What are some of the things you should probably have with you at all times? Because this is what I have in my Skylark at all times. A small but good... Uh, well, simple. It can be as simple as you want, or it can be as substantial as you want. Always have a toolbox of what you need on the road. So I keep a full-on dedicated socket set and wrench set in the Skylark for any occurrences. Because literally anything on that car can be done on the spot. Including doing a head gasket, which is a pain in the ass. It'll take a long time, but you know what? If you're desperate, you can certainly get anything done in a parking lot. It might take you all day, it might take you all weekend, you will get it fixed. And with a torque wrench, you'll be fine. It's a pain in the ass, but you'll be fine. But otherwise, thermostats, water pumps, um, radiators, coolant hoses, spark plugs, uh, engine air cleaners or filaments, filters whatever, fuel filters, mechanical fuel pumps, all this stuff can be easily be changed and replaced with very little time, and you can be back on the road from just a few minutes to a couple minutes. If you're fast and if you know what you're doing, you can change out a fuel pump in about 10 minutes, and you're back on the road. Unless the fuel pump is a fuel sender in your tank and there's more bullshit involved but you can still get it done within about an hour if you're not experienced or if you're skilled you can get it done within 30 minutes or less so there we go oh so let's let's talk about spare parts i'm not talking about spare fenders i'm not talking about spare instrument gauges i'm talking about consumable items that your car is definitely going to need for the long haul brake rotors brake pads brake shoes brake drums if your car's got them, you may as well have some spare parts on hand. Maybe not in your car, because you're probably not going to be needing to do a brake job when out and about, but at home. So it's good to do a little stockpile on some brake components. If, you're, if it's drums, um, so oh, I'll, I'll talk about drums. So disc disc type brakes. What I think you should always have is a couple sets of pads. You can have a set of rotors, cover them in oil for long-term storage, or keep them in the bag. So as long as they don't collect moisture on them, they can last indefinitely. Just make sure you keep them in a place where they're dry. 
In that case, you can keep two sets of rotors. Always, I always like to keep two sets of everything, just in case. So for disc brakes, pads, rotors, and eventually calipers. Not a bad idea to have a spare caliper on each side. Because eventually, or if you're not able to get a spare caliper, at least a spare caliper rebuild kit. Sometimes you're not able to buy your calipers, but you have a chance to rebuild them. So, your front wheels from 1975 onward are always going to be disc brakes. Before then, they were an option on all cars. My Skylux, all drum brakes, so I don't have to worry about so much about that. Oh, universally, both uh, discs and drums keep spare uh, brake bleeder valves. I always keep a spare set, although that's typically for maintenance every several years. Not a bad idea to check out the old valves, put in a new one. That way you know that they're not going to rust up, they're not going to seize, and they're not going to get full of crap when you want to bleed brakes. You're better off doing that. And believe me, you will save yourself a lot of swearing, cussing, and a lot of hardship. So there we go. So, disc brakes. I may as well just make that list. Pads, rotors, calipers, bleed nipples, valves, nuts, have you. Okay. Now let's go to rear brakes. If your rear brakes are discs, the same thing as the fronts. Now, if you have drum brakes, this is the stuff that you're going to need for long term. However, I'm going to tell you this. Drum brakes can last almost indefinitely. You should still inspect. If you bought a classic car and you want to inspect, you may only need to inspect once because often enough, I've never had drum brakes wear out. And if you have, I suspect the previous owner to be a moron. Because there's brake pad material on vehicles I've worked on from 80 years ago that are still intact that don't require replacement. My 67 Skylarks got all original brakes from 1967. Pads, drums, all. So as long as you know how to maintain them, you know how to keep them clean, they will last forever. By the time I'm off this planet, those drum brakes are still going to be original from 1967 just because they're not heat efficient, but mechanically they will last forever. So what to inspect? Drums, pads for wear, if you see ridging in your drums and pad or your your drums and shoes, that's the only time you should ever think about replacing them. And once you do, you'll never have to think about them again. Um, so for inspection, shoes, drums, see if they're still smooth. If they're still smooth, you don't have to worry about replacing them. So as long as they have a good enough thickness for shoe uh, material. You really don't need to worry about that. That's it. Now, self-adjusters, because all these drums should have a, a self-adjuster for shoe uh, position to make sure you get the most amount of surface, breaking surface, in the drums from your shoes. Studebaker was the very first car manufacturer in the world to not only have self-adjusting drums, they're the very first car company in the world to introduce them as standard in 1946, all four sides. So, at that point, since then, if your car's got drum brakes, they're more likely going to have adjusters. Inspect your adjusters, springs, whatnot, the thing that keeps the shoes in the backing plate. The round circle thing that everything bolts and clips onto. Backing plates tend to be a pretty good thick steel. Unless it's totally rotten, then you're better off replacing everything. But most cases, as I've noticed with my time in restoring cars, 
I've never seen a backing plate totally far gone that it needed to be replaced. So backing plate should still be fine. Give it a clean, wipe down, brake cleaner. Quite literally use brake cleaner because it's going to be your friend. So inspect springs, inspect your ratcheting system for the adjuster. See if that still moves freely. If it doesn't move freely, you may want to replace that. Besides that, you can keep your original springs, but you can also replace it. Just wear eye protection. Please, if you're going to fuck around with drum brakes, wear eye protection because that shit's going to spring and it's going to get you right in the eye and you're going to lose an eye. Disc brakes are a little bit more forgiving. Drum brakes are more simple and they're long lasting, but oh boy, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lose an eye, guaranteed. Unless it hits other parts on your body, then it's going to hit and hurt hard. But if there's one place you don't want a spring to get launched into, is directly into your eye, be safe out there, wear eye protection. So now that I say that, inspect your springs, replace any springs. Most cases at that point, if you're going to you buy your theoretical classic car. You can keep your pads. You can probably keep your drums. I would say replace all hardware. Probably your wheel cylinders, which I'm going to get into now. So piston is what presses the pads together in a disc brake setup. For drums, they use a wheel cylinder with little cups and seals. Now my Skylark, since it's a well-built machine, it still uses all original 1967 dated parts. You just have to recondition them, give them a little wipe down, polish them a bit, and then you assemble them back together. And you're set to go for another 25 years for another overhaul. But you may still need to inspect them from time to time. You want to make sure that your wheel cylinders are smooth on the inside. Any bit of imperfection, rust, grit, whatever is going to ruin your seals, going to ruin the polish. The, the polishing in the wheel cylinder, the polishing of the little cups, and you're going to get potential brake leakage eventually in time, which can lead to mushy brake feel or loss of brakes. So, as far as replacing parts, besides your your uh, your brake bleeder valve or nipple, depending on your perspective in life, whichever one it is. Replace the replace the bleeder nut valve nipple. Replace your wheel cylinders, cup and seals. Replace your self adjusters if they're not functioning, or if you don't trust them enough to know what you're looking at. Better off replacing them all. It's incredibly simple. Go online, buy a shop manual for your specific model. It'll tell you everything what you need to do. It's actually, you don't need a college degree to do drum brakes. You just need to have eye protection. Then last, of course, springs. Pretty simple. They're not hard. They're a pain in the ass, but once you get the whole... Once you get the hang of doing... Uh, springs, you, you look online, see how someone else does it. Really, not that bad. Once you do that for your drum brakes, you almost never have to touch them again. Almost never. Your front disc brakes are going to be ones that you're going to be checking out and doing more work on the most than your drums. So, in that regard, braking is the most important part of a classic car because you want to make sure you can stop your bad boy or your bad girl. Or a thing, if it's a Volkswagen Type 181. So brakes are important. I cannot emphasize that much more. Brakes are important. You want to make sure you can stop your 10-ton sled. Because uh, not stopping in a 10-ton sled is terrifying. Okay, so we talked about brakes. We talked about what you should keep on, on hand. Pads, rotors, um... Your rears, if it's drums, there's not much you need to keep on hand. Optional is rubber brake line hoses, the flexible type. 
I would say not a bad idea to replace them regardless. Or if they've been replaced, inspect them. You can perhaps keep an extra spare, but it's maybe not necessary. You don't need to replace them often. Maybe if you're keeping a car long term, check them every five year interval just to see how they're doing. But you don't need to maybe replace them every 10 years, maybe 15, definitely 20 years. As that stuff can expire, but really um, braking, that's kind of what it is. So we went from braking. Let's talk about uh, fuel delivery. Another critical thing with your classic car. You want to make sure it starts. You want to make sure it advances. You want to make sure that when you put on the gas, that it should go forward. So number one thing I always look at. Fuel senders or fuel pumps. If your car is old enough to have a fuel pump, welcome. You just entered a world of easy replacement. And they're, at least with a car with a fuel pump bolted to the engine block, replace your fuel pump. Connect your hoses back together and you're set to go. And keep a spare pump in the trunk just in case. In case you're out at a show, you're driving around, and then all of a sudden you can't get any um, suction. Because how a mechanical fuel pump works is that it has a lever and a diaphragm, and it actually siphons out fuel from the line, from the tank, well, down the line, and it siphons it up, creates pressure up the line going to your carburetor or throttle body think would be fuel sender anyway so if it's a car old enough to have a mechanical fuel pump not a bad idea to replace and after that there's not much wrong to go with it then you want to inspect your fuel tank because all old cars like i have experienced recently had to replace my whole fuel uh, my whole fuel delivery system in the skylark which made it drive infinitely better when it's all brand new is um, check your gas tank. See if it's got any leaks. And if it leaks, take it to a professional, see what they can do to patch up the tank. Because sometimes some tanks are going to be incredibly hard to find. Some cars have aftermarket support, and you can buy a brand new tank right off the bat. Perfect. See, it's for me, it's great to own a GMA body because... I have never a shortage of parts. I never have to worry about that. In 82 Corolla, you're going to have a hard time finding a replacement tank. And you may be forced to repair what wretched tank you have underneath your car. Because it's the only one you're probably going to find for a long time. Until they appreciate these cars in the future, which I doubt. You may end up be re uh, repairing these tanks over and over and over again. Or you find an alternative that will fill in the same role and function as your old tank. Then, if, you're, if, if you have... Now, if it's a mechanical fuel pump, you'll have what is called... Um, which also has a fuel sender, but it's not a mechanical, it's 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 not a front wheel drive setup or fuel injected setup where the fuel pump is also in the tank. Uh, older cars will have a strainer. It's also where you can get your fuel gauge reading from is within the fuel sender itself inside the tank. Not a bad time to replace it once the tank is out because that means that's less sticking around and wondering if your fuel tank is showing the accurate level. Better off replacing it when you can. In most cases, those parts are still around as far as I know, so that should not be an issue. Okay, so that's fuel sending, or that's your fuel delivery um, in a nutshell. At least on the way going to your engine. Let's talk about filters on an old setup. 
The filter is part of the carburetor, very simple. Just replace the filter, it's about six cents. It's an older car like mine, six cents. You can also use the more modern clear plastic filters, the ones that you can see, so that way you're always aware of the condition of your filter. Uh, cars with electronic fuel injection or throttle body, in a sense, will have the fuel filter inside the fuel sender, which not only pumps gas through the lines, but also acts as your uh, fuel float level for your gas gauge. It'll also have built in a fuel filter, so it actually does three things at once. So if you're going to replace your fuel sender in a 80s or 90s car, you did three things all at once. Congratulations, you're doing pretty good. Uh, electronic fuel injection cars, throttle bodies. Maintenance, you could clean the system out. But if you have sea foam, that does a good enough job as it is. If you're not too comfortable with playing around with electronic fuel injection like I am, Basic clean by dumping a can of sea foam into the tank, and you're good to go. However, carburetors are maybe the most sensitive things out there as far as an older car. And honestly, if you have a manual, you can actually rebuild any carburetor on any older car, get it tuned up, bolt it back on, and you will have infinitely better power response acceleration, and even better fuel economy. And a carburetor is not meant to save fuel. It's meant to dump as much fuel down to get the engine to run. Yeah, you can use single or double barrel carburetors. The less barrels you have, the more fuel efficient it's supposed to be, but it's, it's not meant to chuck, well, that's not meant to be fuel efficient. It's just, it's meant to only rely on enough to get the engine to roll. Four barrels or like a uh, six single barrel carb pack that's meant to deliver as much power by dumping as much gas into the engine block, into the cylinders. Okay. All right. But eventually that stuff fills up with varnish. You get sluggish response because the varnish coats everything. And... Um, there's a bit of resistance, there's a bit of sluggishness. Once you can clean it in, in a light acid or other cleaning agents, clean up the varnish, and your carburetor will run fantastic. Often enough better than how it came out the factory because they're still tinkering around with what works per engine and you gotta figure out what it works for your engine. In that case, Always have a spare carburetor rebuild kit on you, at least at home. You don't really need to do it on the way to anywhere unless you really, really want to. Keep one in the trunk as well. Okay. Engine air filter that connects to the carburetor. It's nice to have a spare one with you at all times. Same with fuel filter if it's an older classic car. Modern classic cars, engine air filter, that's it. You, you don't need much more than that. So, let's talk about the engine. It's good to have spare engine oil filters if your car has them. Uh, they've been standard on most cars in the 1960s, was optional in the 1950s, non-existent prior to the 1950s. They just filtered whatever... Actually, there, there's no filtering at all. Just filth everywhere. It's, it's amazing when you, you can find bugs in your oil in a 1940s car. It's fun when you see legs sticking out of oil. So, what are you going to do about your engine? What are some things that you may need to look at? Well, water pump. See if the water pump, if it's got an actual water pump, in which most cars tend to have a water pump. See if the water pump is doing okay or if not, replace. Thermostat. You probably should replace the thermostat on an older car anyway, and replace gasket, 
put in a new gasket, whatnot. Check radiator hoses. See if they're not dry rotted. And if they're dry rotted, replace them. Because you know what? Less pain in the ass down the road. Because let me tell you, dry rotted radiator hoses, not, not a fun thing to have puff of smoke come out from underneath your hood. Not fun. Um, check radiator level before you turn the car. See if it's actually leaking or evaporating coolant somewhere. If you have, if, if the level of the coolant is not where it should be, you either have a leak somewhere, it's burning coolant, which on an older car is possible, but not that, not the end of the world. Unless it's, a uh, uh, unless it's an 80s or 90s car, then you got head gasket issues, or it's just going somewhere. We we don't know. You just gotta hunt and find what what the issue is and solve it. Um, as far as engine, you should always have a few accessory belts on you at all times. Have some spark plugs with you at all times. In fact, have a set of spark plugs. Just in case. Have a set of spark plug wires. You might never know when you need them. Now for an older car, like my Skylark. Keep a distributor cap on you, just in case. Keep an ignition coil on you, just in case. Because uh, you may not know when they uh, do crap out and... Ignition coils last a long time. In fact, the ignition coil on my Skylark lasted 50 years before I accidentally destroyed the thing. And I'm pissed off about it, but hey, you know what? It's got a new ignition coil after 50 years. Newer ones don't last as long, but you know what? Not a bad idea. So now we're at plug wires, distributor cap, um, coils. If, if, if it's got condensers with the coil, replace the condenser anyway. Keep a condenser on you at all times. Uh, let's see. If it's got vacuum advance, but those don't normally go bad, but for an older car, just in case. And if it's... And, and if it's got a distributor... Have a rotor uh, for the distributor as well. Not a bad idea to have replaced as well. Water pumps is something you should just really replace off the bat and not have to worry about. And if you're at water pump, it will probably have the timing chain if it's an older car. Replace the timing chain if it looks good. In most cases, it usually is, but replace it. And never have to worry about the damn thing again. If it's a car with a timing belt, replace that fucker. And you're not going to be bothered with having a spare on you at all times because you should probably be on top of that anyway. And always replace with a fresh timing belt because you really shouldn't have a timing belt just laying around. Just get one when you need one. Accessory belts you can have on your car at all times, just in case, because they're not going to be as essential as a timing belt. Because once that belt snaps, if you have an interference engine, which means the valves, as they go down in the uh, cylinder head, will occupy the same space as the rising piston crown. If it's an interference engine, they're all going to smash together, and now you've got an engine to rebuild or replace. If it's a timing belt and a non-interference engine, means the valves and the pistons do not share the same space. So they're actually going to spin around once the belt snaps. It's not going to create any damage, which is a good thing. All you have to do is just get a new belt, time the cams to their uh, proper sequence, uh, return the cylinder crank, or the, uh, no, the uh, crankshaft uh, to the proper positioning for timing. Put on a new belt, and you're good to go. But there are a few of those engines around, and they're mostly Chrysler, which, oddly enough, is interesting. So, 
that's the engine for you. Beyond that, beyond the scope of this video, if you need engine rebuild, you got to do it. Do it yourself, give it to someone else, whatever. Transmissions, just check your fluid. It's like with your engine, check your engine fluid, or not check, check your engine oil. Make sure it's topped up. If it leaks a lot of oil, if it's a classic car, put in more oil. Or find a way to fix the leak. Transmission, make sure if it's got a filter, change it out. Otherwise, just make sure it's got plenty of transmission fluid in it, because nothing's worse than drying out a transmission and then absolutely destroying the hell out of it. So there we go. Coolant. So we were talking about the radiator. Make sure it's plumbed with coolant, particularly antifreeze, because you don't want to run straight water out of your cast iron engine block. Not a good thing. So there we go. What else? Um... Not a whole lot much to keep on your person for a classic car. So as long as you have your, your tools, some necessary engine replacement parts, just in case. And some other basic maintenance stuff that you should take a look at for an, an, an older car. Um, differential, if it's got a rear axle, change out the differential grease, put a new fluid, call it done. Unless there's metal shavings, chips, broken gears, you really don't need to do much with it. Just plumb it up with good old uh, axle grease oil and you're set to go for a long time. That stuff does not need to get changed out all that often, but it depends on how much drive. It's the same with your engine oil. It's the same as your transmission fluid. It really depends on how much you drive the thing and how hard you drive it. If it's an older car, you may need to change your oil a lot more often because... Just gets dirtier often. Just gets dirtier faster. Okay. So, you want to store your car. You don't want to drive it in the winter, so you want to mothball it a bit. So, not a bad idea to put mothballs in your engine bay. You really, really don't want to. But... Putting mothballs in your uh, in the footwells of your uh, passenger compartment to keep away rats, mice, just from nibbling wires, trunk. So, just one good insurance just to keep away the critters out of your car, particularly in the engine bay, because you don't want chewed up wire. Because one one spring you're going to be going in your car and then realize nothing starts, not even anything clicks, not even the solenoid trying to activate the Starter is even clicking. So, there we go. Oh, another thing about engines. Just reminded me. Starters and solenoids. You have a fresh battery, you're going to start your car. You only hear a click. Potentially, your starter's bad. If you turn on your, your car and you don't hear any clicking, potentially, your solenoid is bad. And potentially, your starter. You hear a click, but no start, replace the starter. Keep your solenoid. Or replace your solenoid. Get it as one whole unit. Doesn't matter. Now, that's a lot of money if it's, a, if it's just the starter. However, if you don't hear a click, it's just your solenoid. Replace the solenoid. It's a lot more cheaper than getting a starter. There we go. Another thing that, yeah, stuff that, that you really don't need on your person, but wouldn't be bad as spare parts, starter, solenoid, basic stuff. Pretty much anything I've mentioned so far, it's not a bad idea to keep. Spare parts, just in case. Preventative maintenance goes quite a long way. And keeping uh, parts on stock for your old car, not a bad idea either. It just helps save the hunting and searching online in the years to come. As some of these parts might get harder and harder to find, it's not a bad idea just to stockpile on stuff. So now what happens now that you want to preserve your car? Of course, give it a wash, dry it up with a nice towel, microfiber, chamois, whatever. Clean your car. Treat your car like it's part of the family. And it'll do fine. 
A uh, clean car is always going to be a happier car. Plus, for car show, clean car uh, really uh, uh, is attention grabbing to a lot of people, inside and out. Even in it, even in engine bays, if you're able to clean a little bit of your engine bay, hey, it's eye candy for all. So you want to preserve your car, you want to store your car, lift your car on all four corners, helps uh, keep the suspension a bit more lively. Uh, you're not relying on the springs to always hold the car up, but then again, we all do that with our personal everyday car. So does it really matter? Not really, but it does help with the suspension, does help with your tires, just doesn't make sure that it doesn't create a flat spot on your tires. That's really the reason why you want to lift your car up. Unless you're not worried, then just don't. Um, put some stable fuel in the tank just to make sure the uh, gas doesn't go bad. If it's a car that's old before 1973 or 74 that still uses leaded fuel, like my car, if you don't have hardened valve seats, you're going to have to put lead fuel additive in your classic car if it's old enough that needs it. Buy a full case of uh, lead fuel additive. Put it in your trunk. Fill it up. Use. You're only supposed to use a certain amount per bottle. I like to fill mine up entirely with just one tank of gas because you know what? I don't care if it's not good for the environment. It's an older car. I don't drive it often. I ain't going to kill anyone. But I'm going to put a full bottle of lead additive in my tank just to make sure it's got enough lead to lubricate the valves, particularly exhaust. And intake, but mostly exhaust, because it actually needs lubrication for the most part. So, if it needs lead additive, always make sure you keep a full case wherever you are in your trunk when you fill up. After 1973-74, your car is running on unleaded fuel. You don't have to worry about that. So, And if you're tired and annoyed of running your car with lead uh, with lead additive you want to make it a little bit more environmentally conscious you can send your cylinder heads off to get hardened valve seats and now you don't have to ever worry about putting lead fuel additive in your gasoline again or if you have like a or well then again this is an inherent design flaw with these types of engines rotary engines not a bad idea just to treat it like a two-cycle. Just put in a two-cycle oil every time you fill up. It might actually keep your uh, apex seals and all the other seals in much better shape if you just add an oil directly into the tank. Just helps your engine all along a little bit. If if it's anything to, to help your, your car operate better, do it. Because your car is going to thank you, and it's not going to crap out on you when you don't need it. It's the same with modern cars. Treat, you treat your car well, car will treat you back. With a classic car, it will still treat you better than it will than you treat it. But a little bit of help goes a long way to help that. So, car insurance for a classic car is not so bad. Depends on what kind of car. But if it's an ordinary, everyday driver, classic car, Civic, Corolla. Camry, Citation, Celebrity, Kev, literally anything that was mundane that people threw away as just disposable cars are going to be very cheap on car insurance. And if you classify it as a classic car, you only drive it in the summer months even cheaper. So to insure a classic car, it doesn't cost that much. So in the long run, not so bad. You can even register your car within your state as a classic car and... Like in the state of Wisconsin, it's a one-time fee. You pay once and never again. So the plates are permanent. Your registration slip is permanent. You don't have to worry about registering your car every year. Some states you do, but you have a few restrictions. As far as Wisconsin is concerned, one time is all. It's expensive, but once you pay for it, you're good to go. So... So for a classic car, if you've always been wondering about wanting to get a classic car, owning and driving a classic car is the most fun. It's the other stuff that you don't consider is what I'm trying to convey that 
This is some of the stuff you need to just look into. Once everything all checks out, then you're set to go. Then you can drive to your heart's content. Because really, an old car is meant to be driven. And they have more heart and soul than most modern cars have. In fact, they have most... Uh, they all have more character, heart, and soul. Because a lot of the cars these days, while they are nice, they're all full of refinement, they are better. They'll never be classic cars to the way that we see 80s, 90s cars. Um, let's see. Hold on. Bear with me with one second. Ugh. So, if your thing is to buy some Econo box or shit box or any box at all. Find what you like out there and enjoy it, appreciate it, and it will definitely appreciate you back by getting all of the attention at car shows because people get bored of looking at Camaros and Corvettes all the time when if you can find a nice celebrity or a nice Cavalier from 83 that's in good shape, that the owner takes good care of his car because he's proud of his car. Even if it's not a sporty car, you're going to get more looks and you're going to get more cred that you're maintaining and upkeeping a car that should have been thrown away 20, 30 years ago and it still exists today really means that you really care about what you own. And you can definitely appreciate that feeling by owning a classic car. Because we're all janitors to these four-wheeled museum pieces. And I'm just one owner of my Skylark, which, when I am gone, it's going to outlast me. And someone else beyond me will appreciate it one day. So if you ever wanted to look into getting a classic car, it's really a lot of fun. It's expensive, but only if you're willing to get something that is not cool, kind of lame, and kind of boring. Like this car. However, getting that gets you probably a lot more practical car. Parts are incredibly affordable, easy to obtain, and really not so bad to repair if necessary. Certain elements might get hard to find, but mechanical stuff you could still get. It's not so much different than an interesting car, because they will both be maintained mechanically the same way. But there's more of a challenge to go get a car that not many people care to keep, but people are going to appreciate you that you did. Because uh, how many times are you going to find a 96 Cavalier at a car show in the near future? Not many. And the one that I do find one day, you, sir, or ma'am, I will gladly shake your hand for preserving something of my own youth and my first car. I miss my fantastic plastic purple people eater. That is my 96 Cavalier. I hated the car because it fell apart. But that was because it was treated like an ordinary everyday driver. But if you can find a mint intact example and preserve it like a classic car, you're going to get someone like me to appreciate this is what my car used to look like when it was new. And you get more nostalgic than hate out of it. Then you know you've done a good job. So with that, if you guys are looking to get something 
old, something boxy, something unusual that is not necessarily what everyone wants as a classic car. If you're looking for something, I really, 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 really recommend you looking at something, anything. Anything you can get your hands on for cheap that's in really good shape. It does not require much maintenance. But what I mentioned earlier, if you can do any of the self-maintenance, just to do a general check about your car, the general health check. If you can do any of the stuff I mentioned before and keep spare parts on hand, you can keep whatever car you end up finding, truck or SUV, on the road for a lot longer than one may even anticipate it should have. So... In that case, happy hunting.